Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. HBO just announced House of the Dragon Season 3 and some changes to the story of Season 2 with them moving some major plot points around, as well as the final end point of the series in Season 4 and what their plan is for moving the timeline to the next major event in Targaryen history after the end of the Dance of the Dragons. So there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. We'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, I'm doing videos for all the episodes just like I did for the original Game of Thrones series. Be sure to subscribe to get all those. I'll explain which plot points they moved from season two to season three. They were very specific about that just because of the way they were plotting out the rest of the show through season four. The first big news is that they reduced the episode count for season two. As much as that sucks, like everyone took a huge L for that, the major reason was because they'd already renewed the show for season three and plotted out which major events they wanted to cover in season three and decided the major battle they were originally going to end season two on would fit better with the part of the Dance of the Dragons they were doing during season three. I'll explain what I think that is in a second, but House of the Dragon season two is now eight episodes, but what we've lost in two episodes, we've gained in two more confirmed seasons, basically. They didn't officially renew it for season four yet, but they do plan to renew it much earlier now, just so that there isn't a big delay between season three and season four. But this is part of the reason for shuffling the story around so much so that they could plan out, get season three going now, start working on scripts while they're still working on season two, just very early days, so there would not be a long break between season two and season three. As you've all probably seen, currently season two won't premiere till summer 2024. That's nearly two years after season one, which really does suck. The reason why the break is so long is because it takes them so much longer to turn a season around than it used to at the beginning of the original Game of Thrones series. You probably remember this slowly happening across the original Game of Thrones series. In the early seasons, there weren't a ton of visual effects, so they were able to turn seasons around relatively close to a year. But as they got to season six, season seven, season eight, the dragons got bigger, the visual effects got bigger, the battles got bigger. Then when we got to the House of the Dragon series, that trend just continued even more visual effects. So you have months and months and months of post-production tacked on to the end of actual production. That's where most of this extra production time comes from. And also to boot, because it took them so long to get House of the Dragon out after the original Game of Thrones ended, they waited till very late, till like right after House of the Dragon had premiered before they renewed it for season two. Normally they would have renewed it much sooner and would have started working on season two much sooner. So Ryan Condal, the showrunner, and George R. R. Martin, who is heavily involved in developing the show, everyone else working on scripts, starting pre-production, plotting out the season, didn't actually sit down to start working on season two until after it had been renewed. So it was just way, way later than they would normally have started working on it. That's how they were able to get the original Game of Thrones series out every single year, pretty reliably up to the last couple of seasons. HBO had renewed the show way further in advance, so they knew they were going to be working on it so they could start working much sooner. So the real blame here kind of lies with HBO dragging their feet. Now that they've confirmed House of the Dragon is a huge hit, we're not going to see as big of a break between seasons in the future, thankfully. Didn't really take a genius to figure out that it was going to be super popular. The same thing will continue after they finish covering the Dance of the Dragon, so I'll explain that later in the video because that'll involve the next part of the timeline that they jump to after season four. The next big thing was that huge battle that they cut from the end of season two, those two episodes that they moved to season three. The way they plotted out season two, Blood and Cheese and the assault on Harrenhal were going to happen at the beginning of the season, two very different types of events in terms of scale, like one is a huge battle, another is a really small but very WTF kind of moment. But both are meant to shake the foundations of the blacks and the greens in both sides of this conflict, like they really set things off in a really big way. Like they really get the actual Dance of the Dragons started in a big way. The actual Dance of the Dragons itself only lasted for about three years, so it wasn't that long, but that's the actual fighting itself. A lot of season one covers the lead up to the Dance of the Dragons, which really didn't begin until after Rhaenyra had learned that Lucerys had been killed by Aemond and Vagar. That was the whole idea in the finale, is that when they were having the Black Council, she was having her coronation with her father's crown. Otto Hightower had come to try and make a bargain with them for the Greens, Rhaenyra said that they would have their answer on the morrow. Then Lucerys is killed by Aemond and Vagar, and then she decides that it means war. So on the morrow, they're going to answer the Greens' question with the answer of war, basically. The actual Dance of the Dragons begins. Later in Season 2, we have the Dragon Seeds. I won't talk too much about the events that lead up to the Dragon Seeds because they involve some spoilers for a few of the other major characters that we saw in Season 1. 
But this is basically the event where Jaceres calls for as many dragon seeds in the realm to mount the six riderless dragons that were currently on Dragonstone. Vermithor, Silverwing, Sea Smoke, Sheep Stealer, the Cannibal, and Grey Ghost. Rhaenyra's forces were able to claim some of them and use them in battle. None of the dragon seeds were able to successfully claim the wild dragons except for Nettles claiming Sheep Stealer. So nobody claimed the Cannibal or Grey Ghost. A couple people died trying to. Gonna watch a couple more people eaten by some dragons during season two. But both those dragons were still involved in the Dance of the Dragons. They just didn't have writers at the time. Then I think the battle that they said they were originally going to end season two on might be the one that happens right after Rhaenyra's side calls all the dragon seas to claim the riderless dragons. It's the Battle of the Gullet, which is the area right between the south edge of Driftmark and the tip of the mainland. It's the gullet that literally feeds into Blackwater Bay. That's why it's called the gullet. And it is known as the bloodiest sea battle in the history of Westeros. So you know, you know it is going to be a huge battle on the show. It's a little bit like Blackwater on steroids from the original Game of Thrones show. Like imagine that times 10. Also the fact that they're going to use two episodes to cover it. In no spoilers, but during that battle, there were a lot, a lot of parallels to what happens at the end of House of the Dragon season one. So originally, I think what Ryan Condal and George R. R. Martin had planned for the end of season two was to end on a similar type of WTF moment that they ended season one on. And what they've done now is move that to early season three, made it even bigger, like I said, two whole episodes, meaning that the new House of the Dragon season two finale is probably all about the dragon seeds claiming the riderless dragons. Maybe they'll end on a teaser at the beginning of the Battle of the Gulf, like things get started with the battle and they end on a cliffhanger and the battle picks up at the beginning of Season 3. There's still a ton of big battles, ton of WTF moments in the Dance of the Dragons between Aemond and Vagar killing Lucerus and the Dragon Seas showing up, so there's still a lot of them during Season 2. It's not like there won't be any huge battles in Season 2, I think they just didn't want to blow too many of the major battles in Season 2. The other side benefit, just in a practical sense, is that with two fewer episodes, they can finish season two and release the episodes way faster, and it becomes much cheaper for them, for HBO, because they are spending like $20 million per episode. So we're still getting all that really important stuff, the really huge battles, the big events, really crazy stuff. They're just pacing everything out between the four seasons now a little bit more carefully. Also, there's the big reminder here that the actual Dance of the Dragons didn't last that long. Like I said, it basically starts with Rhaenyra here finding out about Lucerus' death, then answering the Greens with the call to war. It only lasted for about three years, like not quite three years. Season one was mostly about the lead up to the Dance of the Dragons, leaving you with season two, season three, and season four to cover those three years of the actual dance. Probably in the final episode too, like the season 4 finale, we'll cover some of the aftermath as well. The same way they did in the original Game of Thrones show, they covered the aftermath, what happened to the main characters, directly after that final battle with Cersei. HBO's current plan for House of the Dragon after season 4, when they finish The Dance of the Dragons, is to treat the show like an anthology, so they'll continue calling it House of the Dragon, they'll just do season 5 as a completely different event, jumping to a different part of the timeline with a totally different cast of actors. They'll still be adapting from the Fire and Blood book. That's basically a Targaryen history book written from a couple other perspectives. It's not written in the same first-person perspective, the different chapters of the regular A Song of Ice and Fire novels. It's written more like a history text with other maesters, other people like Mushroom, the court fool, who we saw an Easter egg for during season one, just remembering events in the Targaryen history. That's how they're able to add details to each of the episodes, like, oh, they remembered events a little bit wrong, like the things that they heard about this event and recorded, these maesters, mushroom, were wrong. And a lot of that extra context comes from George R. R. Martin. Like, George R. R. Martin wrote, obviously, the Fire and Blood book, and he helped them write season one, season two. He helped them write the rest of the show, too. So it's not like they're just making stuff up on their own whole cloth. So, like, after season four, there might be, like, a two-year break while they plot out the next part of history, how many seasons the next part of the show is going to run, and they'll jump back in time, do Aegon's Conquest, and they can jump forward again, do the Blackfire Rebellions, and they'll just continue doing that, jumping around in the timeline, treating it like an anthology series. That's how you wind up getting ten seasons of House of the Dragon. It's just a bunch of different events with a different group of actors each time. They didn't actually say which event they planned to do next after Dance of the Dragons. I'm actually hoping they go backwards in the timeline and do Aegon's Conquest next, just because the whole vibe of the Blackfire Rebellions would feel similar to what's happening right now with the Dance of the Dragons in the Targaryen Civil War, like a battle within the family over the succession. 
The Blackfire Rebellions are a little bit different in that it was a battle over the succession between one of the bastards who had been legitimized and named himself Blackfire and the other legitimate heir that everybody assumed would take the throne after his father Aegon IV died. And that's kind of what's happening right now, even though it's not a bastard in the line of succession, like it's two people legitimately within the line fighting for the succession. Aegon's conquest is a completely different type of event, like he's literally just conquering the six kingdoms and trying to conquer Dorne unsuccessfully. There were a lot of easter eggs and references to that during House of the Dragon season one, like recontextualizing the reason why Aegon conquered the six kingdoms. All because of his dragon dream where he saw the coming long night. He didn't know when it would happen, he just saw the Night King coming, this wave of cold washing over the realm. So the only way for the realm to survive would be to unite them, and the only way to do that would be if he conquered them, because there was so much infighting that were happening between the different realms at the time. Let me know in the comments, if they did Aegon's conquest next, who would you want to play those characters like Aegon and his two sister wives? Also, for those of you that have wanted them to do a much bigger version of Robert's Rebellion with like a big series, they could also do Robert's Rebellion as another future House of the Dragon series. They will be filming season two for most of the rest of this year, so we'll get more footage and teasers from the set. I'll do more bonus videos as we see more Easter eggs and things pop up. But if you have any questions about the characters or events during season two you want me to make videos for, just write them below in the comments. Everyone click here for my new House of the Dragon season two teaser video that HBO just released and click here for my full Mandalorian Season 3 Episode 5 video. Thank you so much for watching, everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.